Yeah, good morning, SciScan. So, yeah, I'm a, a member of Project Zero, um, specializing in Windows vulnerability research, mainly in the sort of privilege escalation, uh, elevation of privilege spaces, sandbox escapes, those sort of things, mainly because I kind of like the control you get to find logical vulnerabilities rather than straight memory corruption vulnerabilities. So what am I actually going to talk about? I'm not going to talk about uh, symbolic execution or anything like that. I'm not going to talk about link files, uh, even though that's been obviously quite a, a recent popular thing as the son of Stuxnet has come back. Um, but no, I'm talking about symbolic links on Windows. And from that, I'm going to talk about what symbolic links you can use for exploitation purposes, talk about exploitable bug classes, what you may actually find, and then what you can actually use for exploiting on a Windows system. Some example vulnerabilities as case studies. And then finally, there'll be littered through the presentation various sort of offensive exploitation tricks you can use, which will actually allow you to exploit these vulnerabilities reliably and easily. So does anyone want to admit that they don't know what a symbolic link is? Wow, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, for, the, for those who are probably lying to me about that, um, a symbolic link is something you, you, you usually associate with Unix systems. So it's basically a way of linking one file to another. And then rather than having like a physical link, say sharing directory entries, instead you store the path to the other, the, the other file you're trying to link to. So when the kernel opens this link object, this link file, what it actually does is it reads in the path and then basically reprocesses the path logic and therefore finds your target. This is very useful from a, from a sort of user perspective because you can link between file systems and other resources. But of course, any good piece of functionality in an operating system probably has its downsides. And historically, Symbolic link attacks are, are well known in the, the sort of Unix exploitation environment, especially around local privilege escalation. And you can find them in all manner of places. And it's, it's, it's not that symbolic links are inherently vulnerable. It's just bad programming practices, unexpected behavior, and it's really easy to exploit. So there's kind of three main ways of, uh, three main vulnerabilities you'll find which you can exploit using symbolic links. So the first is resource creation or privileged resource creation. This is where you have, say, a privileged service or a privileged application running, and it creates a file, say, a temporary file. And while, as an attacker, you can't control that file path, you can still drop a symbolic link in that target directory and cause the privileged application to write to somewhere that you, as a normal user, would not be allowed to access. Now, the sort of reverse of that is information disclosure. And obviously, on a, a, on a secured system, there'd be files which you're not allowed to read. For example, the shadow file on a, on, a, on a Linux system. You can't read that because that would disclose the password hashes. But if you can coerce a privileged application to follow a symlink, potentially you can get it to disclose privileged files. And then finally, this is sort of like a mix of the two, um, exploiting time of check, time of use vulnerabilities. So where a privileged application tries to check a file, say it's saying, is this file signed by some sort of public key? And then it will actually use that file for some other purpose. So it executes it or, or whatever. And you can use symbolic links to switch the file between the check time and the actual usage time, and therefore gain privileges that way. So we'll see examples of Windows vulnerabilities which sort of meet all these, these bars as we go along. Now, Windows is something you wouldn't necessarily associate with symbolic link functionality because, for the most part, it's actually undo relatively undocumented. You'll find little bits in MSDN if you really, really look hard, and you can obviously find people discussing it online in forums or uh, web pages. But actually, under the hood, it's usually fairly undocumented. But it's been around since Windows NT came out. So Windows NT 3.1, released in 1993, so a good few years ago now, actually came with two types of symbolic links. The first, object manager symbolic links, and registry key symbolic links. But these weren't file related. These were sort of underlying uh, mechanisms used by the operating system. It wasn't until Windows 2000, in coincidentally year 2000, uh, that the first file level symbolic link came about. 
And these were the, the NTFS mount points or directory junctions. And these weren't file level symbolic links. They only worked as directory redirections. So you have a directory and you can point it at another directory or another drive. You'd have to wait until Vista came out, that wonderful operating system everyone remembers fondly, to finally get full on file level symbolic links. So that's in 2006. So it's a progression of um, 13 years between, between versions. So now I'm gonna go through basically each of, the, each of those t four types and show you how they're implemented in Windows and what sort of things you can do with them. Now I'll start off with a sort of absolute core symbolic link. And you will see this, if you use Windows at all, you'll be probably using this every single day and you probably don't necessarily even realize you are. And that's because things like the, the drive letters, they're actually implemented using these object manager symbolic links. So under the hood, there's a symbolic link called C colon, which when you try and access your file system, redirects to the actual mounted volume in the object manager. And the object manager has a, a file system all of its own, which effectively allows you to access devices and other resources. So it's not just files that the object manager handles. It also handles, for example, registry. The registry is, is handled using a path into the object manager, in this case, slash registry, slash whatever. And even named resources. So the majority of resources in Windows, such as synchronization objects, can be named. So you can get, assign them some sort of unique identifier. And this is also put into the object manager. It's added as an entry into an object directory. And so, for example, semaphores. You can reference a semaphore by name. Now, it's easy to create these symbolic links. As long as you've got right access to one of these object manager directories, you can just call the NT create symbolic link object method, and it will create a symbolic link for you. And you require no privileges to do this. This can be done from absolute guest user running untrusted everything, as long as you've got access to an object directory. But it, it isn't actually documented. This function isn't officially documented anywhere, but obviously it's been around for so long any of the, like, the books about the native APIs will, will tell you the prototype for this function. Now, interestingly, when you create this symbolic link, it only lasts as long as the, file ha the handle to it exists. So when you close the handle, the symbolic link will go away. There are ways of getting it to, s to be there permanently, but it will go away. You, you require elevated permissions to do that. Okay. So, Let's assume we've got a semaphore we want to open by name. How does the object manager handle that process of actually opening that when it encounters symbolic links in the object manager? So in this case, we call the system call NT open semaphore and pass it our, our special name. And the only thing that actually does is it passes that string to a open object by name function. That passes it along to a special function called lookup object name, and this is where the sort of magic happens in terms of finding a resource in the object manager. So it starts splitting up the path, and the path separator is backslash, like it is on Windows, and it starts breaking up that path into individual structures, trying to find the destination. So let's assume, in this case, our first component, my objects, is an object directory. So it just is an object which contains other objects. Well, it can just then look up the next part of the path and carry on doing its business. So the next part is a, a component called global. And it turns out that, in this case, global is a symbolic link. So it's, an, it's another type of object in the Windows operating system. So it reads that data and passes it to a special function, parse symbolic link, which actually extracts out the target string, which points to the target in the object manager. The function then rewrites the original path, so it replaces everything up to that symbolic link name with the new target symbolic link name. Now you've got a problem. The lookup function is the thing which is actually processing this path. But you've just changed the path from under lookup, lookup object name. So path symbolic link has to do something special for the object manager to work out what it's gonna be doing next. And so in this case, it, re it returns a special status code status reparse, which indicates to the object manager, hey, 
I've changed the, the path. You may want to go back and try and reprocess it. And at which point, it'll go back. This could go on for a while. I think it's up to 30 iterations before it'll bail. And eventually, it either finds something or it doesn't. So it's, all, it's pretty simple implementation under the hood. So there's plenty of scope for abuse in this, this regard. The most obvious one is object squatting. So I've said named objects can be created in the object manager. So if you can create a symbolic link to that object name, you can effectively do sort of a squatting attack and get someone to create an object and then rename it and do fun stuff like that. But actually, like file symbolic um, file attacks are probably actually more interesting because they're much more common to occur and much more generally exploitable in, the, in real life applications. So this is the first example of vulnerability, and it was a bug in IE11's broker infrastructure. So IE11, when running in enhanced protected mode, has a broker which actually services um, various functions which it couldn't do itself. And there was a function to open a file which for read access, which wouldn't seem like, well, why does it need to do that? Well, in enhanced protected mode, you can't open most user files. You can open system files, but most user files are off limits. So you needed a function to effectively open this file uh, for, for read access. So the function worked by, obviously, it wouldn't just open any file, because that would be a massive security, security hole. So instead, it has a very specific set of criteria which it must be met in order to open that file. And the first one is given away in its name in that if the file has the mark of the web, so this is a special construct which says this file was downloaded from the internet at some point, it will allow you to open it. Or, crucially, if the file has a .url extension, it will also open it. Now that in itself wouldn't be that useful unless you can get a symbolic link in the way. Because then you can point this symbolic link to anywhere you like as long as a symbolic link has a .url extension, you can open any file you like. But we still need to open that file somehow. And the file system APIs don't obviously provide you access to these object manager symbolic links. They do through, say, C colon. But you don't have permission to write to that location on the file system in order to actually, in the object manager, in order to change the drive letters, at least from EPM. So we need instead to look at the sort of path structures that create file supports. And the first two are obvious ones, relative paths and absolute paths, but the lower two are, uh, are quite interesting. They are generally referred to as device paths, and there is a difference between the dot version and the question mark version, but for this discussion, it doesn't actually matter. We'll just use dot. But what actually happens under the hood is something like this. We call create file with this, NT path, this Win32 path. It then calls an internal RTL function, which translates that into an NT path name, effectively just replacing that, that prefix with slash question mark question mark. And this is the per user DOS device prefix. And I'll be there all day if I start discussing that much further. But effectively, what that's doing is it allows you to open the file using the C colon symlink. And that obviously gets looked up and ends up as a device path. But it turns out there's, there's more than just C colon in this device path location. Another useful symbolic link there is called global root. And global root is a special symbolic link which has no target path. The string is empty, completely empty. So what does that do if you use that instead? You get something like this. It converts it into the NT path name, as you'd expect, and then that symbolic link removes everything prior to global root, and you end up with a raw object manager path. So we can now exploit this to call into arbitrary symbolic links in the object manager because we can, as long as we can find somewhere we can write to anywhere in the object manager namespace, we can affect a symbolic link attack. So for the different sandboxes, there's a few different ones, but effectively, from EPM, you can always write to something. So this is pretty much how you exploit it. You just create a object manager symbolic link, has a .url extension, and then you just pass the special global root syntax to it, and it will open the file for you, any file you like, as long as the user would have permissions to do so. Well, it is only for read, but that's, as I say, better than nothing. Information disclosure is still kind of useful. 
So that's quite a useful, useful trick to know in terms of symbolic links. If you can get an arbitrary path into create file, there's a good chance you can use symbolic links. Now, the next symbolic link type I'm not going to discuss in any great detail. If you look at some of my previous IE, EPM, sandbox escape work, you will find attacks using registry key symbolic links. But the thing to bear in mind with this is how they're actually implementing it, because I think it's fairly instructive as to how the sort of way that the original developers sort of thought about how to do symbolic link functionality in the operating system. Because if you look at actually how it works, it's almost exactly the same as the object manager symbolic link functionality. They've replaced parse symbolic link with parse key and as an additional function to pull out the symbolic link data. But effectively, it's doing the same thing. It reads out symbolic link string, modifies the current path, and then returns status reparse to effectively restart the lookup process. Sadly, since Windows 7 at least, registry key symbolic links are nowhere near as, as fruitful as they used to be. Um, for, his, for a start, they block symbolic links between user hives and, trust and system hives. You can't booby trap your current registry and get a system service to write registry keys in, in the local machine, for example. And it turns out the symbolic link data must still be a valid registry path. So you can't get it to do any funny tricks by going into the object manager or anything like that. It still has to be parsable as a registry path, which is a bit of a shame. But you can still use it for user to user. So as I say, the IE EPM escapes are still good, good examples of this use because it still doesn't require any privileges whatsoever to use, which is kind of useful. So the third symbolic link type is mount points. And this was, as I say, introduced in Windows 2000. And it was the first file system level symbolic link, as far as I'm aware, in the, in the Windows NT operating system. But it only allows you to junction between directories and another directory. And it's called two different things, depending on what you read. It's either called mount points, where it's used in the context of mounting another drive under a directory in your hierarchy, or directory junctions, where you're just linking other directories together. But it is still a symbolic link, and it still works. It's the same functionality. It's just called different things, depending on what you're doing with it. Now, this diagram should look awfully familiar, because it is basically exactly the same diagram again. You've now replaced parse key with parse device, and you end up in the NTFS driver, but it is the same thing. So when the I.O. manager, in this case, or the NTFS driver, encounters a, re a special reparse point stream in the NTFS directory, it will actually extract that data, do the re reprocessing of the file path, and then return status reparse back to the, to the object manager, at which point everything kicks off again. So exactly the same operation as you'd expect, but in this case, file system APIs. So what's actually in that reparse point buffer? It sort of looks something like this. So this is mostly documented in the, um, in the NT headers, um, but effectively what you've got is that you've got a common header, which, because there's multiple different reparse point types, and this common header has a tag which says, I am a mount point type of reparse point. And then you have two things. You have a substitute name, which is the new NT path name to replace it with, and also a print name, which is there just to give useful information to the user. And creating a mount point is pretty simple. You build that reparse point buffer with your data, create a directory anywhere you like. As long as you can create the directory with write access, you, you're good to go. And then set uh, an FSCTL to set the reparse point buffer. And again, this requires no privileges whatsoever. So you can do this from absolutely untrusted user as long as you can open a directory and write to it. Sadly, there are some limitations to mount points. Um, the, probably the biggest one from an attack perspective is the directory has to be empty. So you can't sort of just change a, a directory in the hierarchy to be a repass point. It must contain no other files or directories, which is a bit of a limitation. And it also must target a particular I.O. device. So it can only be local devices. It can't go to remote file systems, for example, which um, is a bit of a pain because you could do clever stuff like redirecting to named pipes or something crazy like that. But the object manager just, just will not have it. OK, so 
this then vulnerability is an attack which used mount points to actually get an arbitrary file overwrite on the system from a system service. And it has some interesting tricks in order to win a timer check, timer use race. So the bug itself was in the task scheduler. The task scheduler writes uh, XML task files to the, uh, to the disk. And before you run it, it will reload that task file and verify that the hash of the task file matches what it thinks it should be. Now, there was a pretty old bug, which um, I think Stuxnet uh, abused, that it used a really, really weak hashing algorithm. I think it was just CRC. So it was trivially brute forceable. But now we use SHA-256. You can't trivially modify this. But you can get it to fail. And if it fails, it will rewrite that task file. So it will create a new copy of that file and rewrite it back to disk. And the majority of file operations in the task scheduler are done using impersonation. So when you call, as a normal user, a task scheduler service, it will only do as much damage as you can do yourself. And therefore, it's not that, that useful. But I found one edge case where it didn't impersonate correctly, and it would write a file as local system. And this is in this rewrite task file functionality. So we've got a, we've got a timing window here. We can, if we can exploit the, um, the uh, if we can ex change the directory mount point underneath this task scheduler between the point where it reads the file and the point where it writes the file, then potentially we can get an arbitrary file override. Unfortunately, the task structure is writable as a normal user. Even though you're only writing it from this task scheduler service, normally you can write files to this, direct to this directory, create new directories. So we can get a write access to a directory object and therefore write a mount point to it. So we got this box of how do we win this race condition? And you could brute force it. That, that would probably work on most systems. But it would be pretty awesome to have a 100% guaranteed, yes, it's definitely going to work um, kind of technique to exploit these type of vulnerabilities. And this is where opportunistic locks come into it. So an opportunistic lock is a mechanism which allows you to put a lock on a file, and then ask for a callback, effectively, an event being set when that file is tried, it, someone else tries to access that file. So this is used for things like search indexes, indexes, for example. If you're indexing someone's documents, and that person then wants to open their own document, it would be kind of rude to just say, no, sorry, I've locked that file. You're not, you're not allowed to open it. So this allows the search indexer to relinquish the lock on the file when asked. But it has a very useful property in that you can effectively stall the open of a file indefinitely, do something in that time frame, and then release the opportunity lock, and it will all carry on as is. So it works basically like this. I create a, a task folder, and I create a task underneath it, but I, I add a mount point to the task folder, so it's pointing to a dummy directory. And that's kind of crucial because of the no files in a, in a directory restriction on mount points. I then issue a run command after putting an opportunistic lock on that task file. The IO manager then goes, oh, someone wants to open this file. Uh, do you mind releasing it so this, this guy can carry on with his job? At which point, we get an event callback. And we can now go, aha, we'll change the mount point, because we've got an exact timing signal to exploit this vulnerability. We then release the op lock just by closing the handle. The task scheduler can now continue on with its job. But interestingly, the IO manager was already 100% settled on what file it was going to open. This is post all the mount point reparsing operations which have been going on. So this is basically the absolute, it's going to open that dummy file. So it finds that file is corrupt in whatever definition of corrupt would be. So it rewrites it. But now, it's rewriting to a completely different location. We've pointed it at Windows, and we've actually got it to write a file to the Windows directory instead of the original dummy directory. So again, there's a few limitations to this, unfortunately. Um, so you can't block access to attribute access. But there's, there's some tricks you can play. You can do op locks on directories. So whenever you open a directory for listing, it opens it read access, and you can actually then abuse that as well. So there's a few examples on our issue tracker where I've used this to do things like information disclosure and using it as a timing signal just for that. 
So I can quickly do a little demo of that just to, just to prove that it actually works as I, as I say. So I've got a few um, tools which I've written to do sort of testing of symbolic links. This is actually open source, so you can have the link at the end, so you, you can actually just download these and have a play yourself. But I've got one which is called set up block, and if we go and open this file, so we, we are plock on that file. If we now open, oops. If we now try and open this, say, notepad, we'll see notepad is kind of stuck and doesn't seem to be doing anything. And now we've got our signal back. So we can actually see that our op lock has been triggered. If we hit enter, we'll now find notepad is finally actually woken back up to life and, and read that file. So really, really helpful. And it will just go on forever. I don't think there's a time limit. It will never expire. So the final symbolic link uh, functionality added in Vista was file level symbolic links. And it looks pretty much like a normal reparse point buffer, except in this case, you can do it on a file as well. So you can open a file and set the reparse point buffer. But there's a problem. From a from an exploitation perspective, we can't assume we're admin, otherwise, well, there's probably not a great deal of point in trying to exploit this. But unfortunately, you need a special privilege. And the only person who gets this privilege, by default, is admins. So. By default, as a normal user on a default install of Windows, you can't use this functionality at all, which kind of seems a bit unfair. But I thought I'd have a look at how it's doing this uh, checking to see where it's doing the privilege check. And if you've done any sort of driver development or driver exploitation, you'd expect to see a uh, call to something like SE single privilege check, which says check that this caller has the privilege. But if you look at the set repars function in the NTFS driver, there isn't one. The only thing it does is it checks for a particular flag in the current sort of file context. So having a bit of a play around, I found where it was actually doing this. And it's in this function instead. And so if you're running in kernel mode, or you have this privilege, or you've got restore privilege, it will set this flag. And you can then set symbolic links. But this is called during open, and not during the set repars point function. So that leads to an interesting um, hypothetical scenario in that if you have a kernel driver which will return you back access to a file, which is open for write access, but say you don't have access to that file directly, you couldn't influence it using any other symbolic link tricks, but it still just returns you the handle, because it opened it in kernel mode, that file handle always has access to write a symbolic link to that, that file. So effectively, you can get symbolic links if, you've got a, if you can find a buggy driver. And I'm not saying that there is one, but there probably is somewhere. So considering you need privileges, I thought, what else supports these symbolic links? And another thing Vista added was support for symbolic links in SMB version 2. And you can find the, the specification for it, the documentation of how it works. But again, there's a problem. Symbolic links by default, will not be followed on SMB v2 shares, which kind of defeats the point of implementing them in the first place. Because by default, you're not going to allow them to work, and no one's going to change the defaults, and no one's ever going to use them. But it's probably for security reasons. So yeah, it would, it's pretty rubbish. Unless there's a bug in the implementation of the driver, of course, which it turns out there was. Because basically, if we go back to our parse device function, it's not SMB v2 which is honoring this local to remote uh, symbolic link functionality. It's actually the, the I.O. manager itself. And so it does a check. Was the last device before my repass point a, a network device? Is the new device a local device? Don't allow it. But it's in exactly the same place as the handling for mount points. And mount points do not check the source device. They only check the target device, which allows you to write to, the, say, the C drive. So obviously, someone must be checking that there's somewhere higher up that it's honoring the specification and only returning a reparse buffer for a symlink. So if you look in the standard, it says a server must set this field to the, the tag. But if you actually look at the SMB v2 driver, it never checks. So obviously, the server must set it, but the, the client can just completely ignore it, which kind of defeats the object. 
So you can do something like this. If you've got a malicious server, you can create a file, return a mount point symbolic link buffer instead of a symbolic link reparse buffer, and actually get it to open a remote local file, which in certain circumstances can be useful. So quick demo, because even though I submitted this to Microsoft, uh, they decided that it was, didn't meet the bounds of a security bulletin. So apparently, group policy is not a security boundary or not a security feature. I can't remember exactly what. So. <laughs> so I've got my dodgy Samba s server. And it's been configured to read a file called symlinks.txt, which allows you to remap a one file to another file. So in this case, I'm going to map it to your super secret text document on your, on your user profile. So just to demonstrate, so hello, Sci scan. Yeah. So then you can use, in this case, a HTML file, which is served off the same server. And because of the way Internet Explorer handles XML HTTP requests to file resources, I can actually try and open example.txt. So if I run this, it will open example.txt. This is running off your remote share. So if you can convince someone to do this, you can do it. And if I click OK, it's now posted the contents of that file to a remote server and has just stolen some data off your hard disk. And obviously, it works in reverse with writing, but from Internet Explorer, it's a bit more difficult to do that. So the final sort of bit is sort of my thoughts of, wouldn't it be nice to have file level symbolic links without the permissions to do so? Because we obviously can't because we need privileges to do it. But we also want it to be accessible via a normal directory on the file system. So that got me thinking. The SMB v2 vulnerability demonstrated that even though mount points were only for directories, it didn't matter that you redirected to a file. So presumably, the object manager didn't give a, give a stuff, and it would just open anything you like. So I thought, OK, what if I set a mount point pointing at a file? So not pointing at a directory, pointing at a file. And the first thing which happens if you try and do that is you get an access denied. Unfortunately, you can't see this too well because of the resolution of the screen. But if you open it, it will return access denied to you. And so, OK, obviously, it doesn't work. But if you specify the special flag, uh, backup semantics flag, which is used to normally open directories, it will actually open the target. It will open the file you pointed to using the mount point, which is interesting behavior, because obviously that's not kind of what you expected to happen. If you go deeper, if you go onto the native layer, so the NT create file layer, you end up with a paradox. So that the NT create file API has a set of flags. And strangely, one of the flags is open this file as a directory. And then even though we're talking about files here, the opposite flag is not like nothing. The opposite flag is open a non-directory file, because that makes perfect sense to anyone. But if you, open a direct, if you open it with the directory file flag, you will get a status code of not a directory. Thanks. OK, fair enough. That kind of makes some sense. If you open it with a non-directory file flag, it returns you the file is a directory. So stop, stop being stupid and, and, and actually do a proper job of this. But it turns out you can just not specify a flag at all. So if you find something not specifying the flag at the native layer, it will actually open a directory uh, mount point as if it was a file level symbolic link. Now there's also the old uh, ADS stream trick of dollar index allocation. If you specify that as your stream type, this is like a classic trick to create directories using the normal file APIs. And it also works for file-level file symbolic links. If you specify the name with dollar index allocation at the end, it will actually open the target of that symbolic link, even though that target is a, is a file. So unfortunately, that kind of limits what you can do. It's a bit, bit crappy at that point. So I needed something slightly better than this. You still need arbitrary access with no obvious prerequisites on the, on the call to create file. So if anyone actually knows where that's from, um, we want to combine our powers. We have two types of symbolic links which reflect the handling of the object manager. We have object manager symbolic links. 
which can do file level type symbolic links. And we've got mount points, which we can put our arbitrary object manager paths into. Can we combine those two together to achieve our goal without actually requiring any privileges whatsoever? And it turns out, surprisingly, we can. And so effectively what we do, we set a mount point somewhere on the file system, which points to a directory, object directory we can control, we can write to. So in this case, say RPC control, because that's quite a nice and easy one to do. So the first operation, the NTFS driver parses out the mount point and reparses the, the file and passes back status reparse. Now, unlike the registry key symbolic links, the NTFS driver does not, cannot presume to know the destination device you're trying to access. And so makes no verification of this. It just hands it back to the object manager and says, hey, guy, you worry about this. I, I, I can't do anything more with it. Obviously, at this point, the object manager's code gets involved, parse symbolic link gets called, and we can now actually just drop an arbitrary symbol link somewhere and, get and do whatever we need to do. And so it's a really simple trick, but it does just sort of work out the box. There are, of course, limitations. That first limitation is that non-persistence of, of symbolic link objects. So if you try to attack, say, a bug in the, in the profile manager, which I also found, you can't persist between login sessions. But it turns out that CSRSS will do it for us. We can actually create, even though it's for defining DOS devices, it doesn't actually check that it's a device type name. It's not a drive letter, which is kind of silly. But you can use that to create a permanent object which will last between login sessions. And of course, there's other limitations. You can't actually list the object directory as a file directory, so that doesn't work too well. But there's, there's tricks you can pull to get around that. OK, so that's basically the end of my, my technical stuff. But I felt I can't really go away from, from a side scan talk without at least demonstrating one symbolic link attack, which gains your local system, which is currently unpatched, because, hey, why not? So I've just got a, an executable here, which does some magic. And you'll see a command window pop up. And then you'll see another command window pop up. And hopefully, we'll see a crucial difference between the two. And this is running as a normal user. So let's hope it works. OK, so we've got a, a, our uh, command prompt. And uh, yeah, it should be local system. So that's, yeah, currently unpatched. But Microsoft do know about it, of course. So I said I'd open source these symbolic link tools. Yes, you can, you can download them from here. If you follow that link, you can download them, open source, patch your license, all that sort of stuff. And that file tool which I showed, the little sort of graphical tool you can also download, is kind of useful to play with fun, interesting um, file APIs without actually having to rewrite code every time. So thanks very much. If there's any questions on that, um, or catch me for a beer later, and that, that'll be fine. But uh, if anyone's got any questions, let me know. Questions? The demo or your trick that you pulled with the um, Internet Explorer page, HTML page, posting back the content of a client file to the server. Um, why did you? I mean, it was it was awesome presentation, but um, why did you choose to go via the HTML with post back to get the file content? Like, isn't there a way to directly? You know, if you assume that a client is browsing your network share, for example, and then it tries to open directly a file path, couldn't you get the client? Like document otherwise, or do you need to go that reroute basically to to pull the, the client file content? In this case, you, you do need it to have some control. You need to be able to read back the content somehow. So in this case, it was just exploiting the fact that I could read a file. I was allowed to read from my share directory, um, but that file then redirected to a local file, which the IE can't see. But there's, there's other tricks you can do, things like if you've if you can get someone to, to write a file to a malicious share, you can get it to write to anywhere on the, lo on the system. This, I just felt, was a, very si a relatively simple demonstration of how you could actually practically exploit it in some way.